Hi, this is Pastor McLaren for the Men's Reformed Fellowship, a ministry of First Presbyterian Church in Perkasie, Pennsylvania. Our church is located on the corner of Fifth and Race Streets uh, in, in downtown Perkasie. Um, as much as you can say we have a downtown, this is it. Um, please come by and visit with us from Sunday to Sunday, and we'd love to meet you and uh, fellowship with you, worship God together with you. Today, our men's group uh, continued its look at Dr. R.C. Sproul's book, Essential Truths of the Christian Faith. We made our way through the 40th chapter, which is on the illumination of the spirit. And uh, we had a nice discussion regarding that. Um, you'll recall that we are making our way through a section of this book that focuses on the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we've seen how the scriptures describe the Holy Spirit as the third member of the Blessed Trinity, uh, equal in power and glory with the Father and the Son. Uh, the Spirit is a personal uh, being, uh, third, the third person of the Trinity, and so he's not a force, but he is present to instruct, to teach, to guide, and even to convict, as we saw uh, last Sunday at First Church in our sermon series. So the Spirit is divine, personal, and we saw as well that the Spirit is one who uh, testifies to our hearts that first, the Scriptures are the very Word of God, and second, that we are the children of God. Uh, this internal testimony of the Holy Spirit is unique to the people of God. Uh, the rest of the world does not receive that testimony, but the Spirit comes within the hearts of those who have been given to Him. The Father chooses a people, gives them to the Son. The Son accomplishes their redemption at the cross and then gives the application of that redemption to the Holy Spirit. And in the course of history, the Spirit goes about uh, bringing the wonder and beauty and glory of salvation to all those whom the Father gave to the Son to save. And so the Spirit comes and testifies within our hearts, the hearts of believers, that we are indeed the children of God. Now this sets us apart from the mainline Protestant who considers that all people are children of God and really the work of the Spirit and you need to understand that in a pantheistic fashion rather than in a theistic uh, Trinitarian fashion. Uh, the work of the Spirit is to enable us to appreciate that we are all children of God. And that's not what the scriptures present. In fact, Jesus uh, speaks to some of his day, uh, the Pharisees and others, as children of the devil. They're not children of God. They're not children of Abraham, a man of faith. They were children of the devil. And there is within the world these, if you will, these two seeds, uh, the children of the devil and the children of God. There's the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And these two are in conflict throughout the course of history. The kingdom of light is occupied by all those whom God has delivered from the kingdom of darkness and placed them in his kingdom of light God has sovereignly chosen them and brought them to himself and brought them into this kingdom according to his purpose and will by his sovereign grace. The remainder he leaves in their sin to suffer the consequences of their sin and rebellion. He will judge them along with Satan himself. And so the children of God are unique in the world today. There is a certain sense in which we are all children of God. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17 uh, quotes from one of the uh, Greek prophets that, said, that says something to the effect that we are the offspring of God and indeed God has created us and in a general way we can say that all of humanity is, a, uh, are, is composed of the children of God. We are his creatures but we are children who have been dispossessed because of our sin. We've been driven out of his house uh, in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve and their sin. They were cast out of the garden. They were dispossessed. And so uh, we are um, uh, outside of the family of God. And what God must do is then adopt us into his family. We are the adopted sons of God. Jesus alone is the true son of God by nature. 
and we are adopted into his family through the redemptive work of Christ. And so the Spirit of God testifies that we are the children of God. Now, this morning we moved along in Dr. Sproul's book to consider the illumination of the Holy Spirit. And the internal testimony and the illumination of the Spirit are rather similar. Uh, These are works uniquely given to the Holy Spirit. So Christ uniquely goes to the cross and and bears the penalty for sin. That is the work of the Son of God. Uh, The Spirit does not suffer on the cross. The Father does not suffer on the cross. It is Christ the Son who suffers for us. That's his unique work in this world. The Spirit's unique work uh, is now being explained here uh, with the internal testimony of the Spirit for believers and as well now the illumination of the Spirit. So the Spirit testifies to the Word of God that it is truly the Word of God, that it is true, that we can believe in it. The Spirit also now illumines us, illumines our hearts and minds so that when we read the truth of God, we can understand it and incorporate it into our lives. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. When we say that uh, we cannot understand the scriptures on our own, uh, we need the help of the Holy Spirit. The problem is not with the scriptures, as though they are confusing, or they are dull, or uh, uh, they're just inherently uh, irrational. No, the scriptures are perfectly clear. Uh, There's no ambiguity about them. Uh, They are true altogether. The problem is not with the scriptures. The problem is with us, with our sinful nature and the impact of that sinful nature on our minds, our hearts, our will, and so forth, our affections. And so the natural man, when he comes to the scriptures, cannot understand them. They don't make sense to them. The Apostle Paul uh, speaks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 where he says that the the, the scriptures are spiritually appraised. They are spiritually discerned. The natural man does not receive the things of the spirit. Um, They don't make sense to him. Uh, What we need is for the spirit to reveal the word of God to us so that we understand that. And so uh, there needs to be this gracious work of God illuminating us, enabling us to see that which is true in God's word. Uh, You might think of an individual who's blind. You put him out in a field, and the the field is beautiful with all of its many different grasses and and flowers, Uh, the birds and and various insects that flitter about. You've got a backdrop of trees, maybe a mountainside off in the distance, a lake or what have you. It's a beautiful scene, but the blind man cannot see it to appreciate it because his eyes are not opened. There's nothing wrong with the vision out there of the the field and the trees and the mountains and so forth. All that is there is perfectly clear, crystal clear. The problem is not with the created world order. The problem is with the blind man whose eyes are not open to see. And similarly, the word of God is perfectly plain plain and clear. The problem is that our, our minds are corrupted and blinded by sin. And so part of our regeneration, part of our inner renewal by the Holy Spirit, the new birth, is that we are enabled then to see the kingdom of God. You can see that in John chapter 3 where Jesus speaks with Nicodemus. You must be born again to see the kingdom of God. Um, You know, Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount spoke about uh, the... Uh, darkness of the human heart or it's being illuminated. He he speaks of the individual whose eye is clear, then his body is filled with light. But if his eye is darkened, then the body is darkened. And he says, how great is that darkness? And he's not here merely talking about uh, physical vision and the significance of vision for our lives. Our lives are brightened, I think, and... uh, enriched by our ability to see color, shapes, sizes, all these kinds of things by what we see. Uh, Whereas if we are blinded to these things, we are not only deprived of the beauty of the world around us or even its complexity and 
sometimes it, it's uh, ugly filth too, but uh, we're, we're deprived of that, and then that works within us maybe a sense of depression and despair and a hopelessness that we can't see these things that other people see. And so Jesus uses this very human analogy to talk about the kingdom of God. And what he's trying to say here is that there needs to be a, an opening of our eyes so that we can see the kingdom of God. And if we can see the kingdom of God, that will illumine our hearts and lives and fill us with light. Make our lives filled with joy, truth, holiness, goodness, all these kinds of things. Because the Spirit has opened our eyes to see. You need to have eyes that are opened and illumined to see what God has for you in the world around you. The natural man has blind eyes when it comes to spiritual things. Yes, he can understand a little bit about what the Bible says. He can read the text a little bit and uh, have some sense for something of what it has to say. But really in putting it all together, really in understanding it, seeing its truth, seeing its power, its glory, its uh, significance, uh, the natural man, unaided by the Spirit, will never appreciate what the Scriptures have. I can say that that is true of my experience. I was thinking recently of my uh, experience before coming to faith in Christ, and I just remember uh, the Bible being a, a, a weird, strange thing to me. I just had no interest in it. Its message did not have any significance for me. And the same was true of Christian worship. I had no interest in being in a church, had no interest in listening to a sermon. Uh, none of this made particular sense to me. And, uh, uh, and that's the way it was until the Spirit of God opened my heart, enabled me to see, and then the Scriptures became filled with light, and I couldn't wait to read the Scriptures. I couldn't wait to get to church and have the pastor explain the Word of God to me. These are things that uh, came alive for me because of the Spirit's work in my life. And so there needs to be this inner work of the Spirit whereby he illumines our minds and hearts to receive the truths of God's word. You know, Jesus, uh, in Matthew chapter, I believe it's chapter 11, he prays to the Father and he says, Father, I thank you that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to babes. And this was pleasing in your sight. Uh, God was pleased to hide the, the truths of the gospel, the truths of the kingdom of God, the glories of God's work in Christ. He has hidden those things from the wise and the intelligent that, uh, of the day, those who were the great leaders of the church of that day, great leaders of the uh, synagogues and uh, the, the political leaders as well, uh, all the uh, great business people of the day. These things were just obscure and blind to them, as sophisticated as they were, as advanced as they were in learning and intelligence and so forth, they could not appreciate the kingdom of God as Jesus revealed it. But Jesus says, but you have revealed these things to babes. And here uh, the world looks upon many of those within the church as uh, unsophisticated, uh, as weak-minded, uh, and, and things like this, and they get caught up in mystical, mythological things, and uh, to use the terms of um, Karl Marx, uh, uh, religion is the opiate of the masses. It's just something to keep them occupied and to soften the, the harshness of life for them, and that's all that it's good for. It's just a drug to sedate them, to control them, and to amuse them. The real intelligent people, in Marx's view, uh, the sophisticated people, don't need that crutch. They don't need that drug. They don't need the opiate of religion. Uh, they see life as it really is, and they are the mature. Well, Jesus says that God has revealed the kingdom of God to those who are babes. And he reveals spiritual truths and realities that folks like Karl Marx and others will not appreciate, cannot appreciate. And this is the work of the Spirit. He illumines the hearts and minds of the people of God. It's the new birth. It's regeneration. 
Uh, but it's, we, we are seeing here the noetic effect of the Spirit in uh, opening our minds to be able to see and understand. Uh, that is uniquely the work of the Holy Spirit within the life of uh, God's people. Now, as those who are illuminated by the Spirit uh, at the new birth, we then need to continue to seek the Spirit's illumination in our spiritual life. And so when we come into a worship service, when we come to sit down before the scriptures and private devotions and read them, we need to consciously be aware of the fact that we need the help of the Spirit to understand still the things of God's Word. Uh, there are things which are very simple and plain and rudimentary in the scriptures. The writer to the Hebrews speaks of such things. They're very basic truths that we need to understand. But then there are things that require a certain measure of maturity, uh, a certain measure of growth, uh, of discipline. And so we need to have our minds uh, fed not only on the milk of the word of God, but also on the meat of the word so that we can grow strong in Christ and become men in the scriptures, men who are strong in the word of God and ready to serve Christ uh, to his glory and praise. And so this is the work of the Holy Spirit for the church to illumine our minds as we grow in our spiritual lives. And so in uh, Psalm 119, which is a psalm which reflects in a poetic way on the law of God, on God's word, on his statutes, his revelation of himself, which ultimately climaxes in the coming of Jesus Christ, uh, the, the psalmist there prays in the 18th verse that God would open his eyes that he might see wonderful things from God's law. And so when in the old covenant the believer looks at the law of God, it does not just present itself as a bunch of moral absolutes which must govern our lives, but he sees the wonderful things of God's law and how they anticipate the Christ who was to come to bring us redemption. And so the, the mind illumined by the Spirit enables us to see Jesus in the Scriptures. You remember Jesus when he met with his disciples following his resurrection, he gathered them together and he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And he showed to them from the scriptures how the Christ must suffer and die and rise again on the third day according to the scriptures and that uh, the forgiveness of sins and everlasting life might be proclaimed in his name. Jesus had to open their minds to understand the true import of the scriptures. And so the scriptures lead us to Jesus Christ and the spirit enables us to see that and to see the implications of that for all of life and so this is the great uh, blessing that we have in the Spirit's work as believers if we struggle with the Word of God we should pray that God would open his word to us and enable us to properly understand the Word of God there are many people who go to the scriptures in a presumptuous fashion and assume that all they need to do is read a text here a verse here a verse there and think that they understand it and, and they don't I've seen many who uh, distort and twist the scriptures. Even those who can quote a lot of scriptures, they take them out of context, and don't understand them in the whole broad sweep of the scriptures and their message. And so uh, they distort the message of scripture in different places in different ways. Um, you know, as a believer, as a Christian, when we come to the scriptures, we, we should train ourselves to think uh, and meditate on what scripture has to say. And there are certain uh, basic rules to reading any text which would apply to scripture as well. We should always look at a particular text in the light of its broader context. That broader context enables us to understand what it is exactly and precisely that the text is trying to say. Now, I'll use an illustration which is from the realm of politics, recent politics. Uh, I'm not going to affirm the truthfulness one way or another. Just use the illustration for you and we'll work from there. Uh, it's uh, said that uh, President Trump on his visit to England here on the 70th, 75th anniversary of uh, D-Day was informed that uh, Meghan Markle, the princess uh, there in England, uh, had some nasty things to say about President Trump and he 
said, I didn't realize she, she was such a nasty person. Now, Trump in a later interview tried to clarify by saying, I didn't mean to say that she was a nasty person all the way around. It's just that the things that she said right here were nasty things about me. Otherwise, she's a very wonderful person. Now, I'm not going to hear, you know, judge the, what took place there. Just simply note that we should take the president's statement here in a broader context and understand it in the way that it was intended and not merely uh, take something out of the context and make it look like he has this uh, very mean and unfair portrait of other people. Uh, that's true of our study of Scripture. When we come to a text of Scripture, we have to understand it in its broader context, within the context of the, the few sentences before, the few sentences after, the paragraphs that lead up to it, the whole book, the author that was writing this book, the time period in which it was written, uh, how that whole text relates to other books by the same author, how it relates to uh, other uh, texts in the New Testament or in the Old Testament, you know, just the whole flow of redemptive revelation needs to be taken into consideration when we come to one particular verse of Scripture. And I find that time and time again, people don't do that. I remember some time ago now, we had a discussion in our Sunday school class uh, on Philippians chapter 4, verse, I believe it's verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And the old King James Version says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And there were some within the Sunday school class that were upset with the modern translations that said, I can do all things through him who strengthens me because they felt that that was taken away from Christ. Well, if you look at the context, it's very clear what Paul was saying. He was saying it's Christ. Christ is the one in whom we are strengthened to do all things. There's nobody else that can do something like that. But these folks were just fixating on that one verse and that one word and saying, well, these modern translations are trying to diminish the work of Christ and eliminate him from the Bible and say, I can do all things through um, Epaphras or some other thing or what have you and not look to Christ. Well, that's just silly. That's not what the text at all means to say. All you need to do is look into the previous verses and see who the, uh, uh, the pronoun refers to. Uh, it's not that hard to, to figure that out. Uh, you can think as well of 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, where the King James says something like, uh, God was revealed in... I should look that up for you and get it. I think it was Christ was revealed by the Holy Spirit, uh, preached on in nations, proclaimed, and so forth. Now I'm getting the verses wrong. Uh, but uh, again, it's the same sort of thing. Is it Christ there or... Uh, he, the personal pronoun. Well, he in English grammar refers to someone who was spoken of earlier in the text and very clearly is Christ. And so all you need to do is the basic, observe the basic rules of English grammar and of reading to understand what Paul has to say. And uh, I think there, there, there's people who are uh, functioning on the basis of an agenda that's hostile to scripture that motivates them in that respect. Well, that gets us a little bit far afield, but we need the help of the Holy Spirit to illumine our minds. We need to have our minds transformed and not conform to this world, as Paul says in Romans chapter 12. And so there is a continual training ongoing within us. Uh, and part of that will be just the ordinary things of studying, learning languages, learning how sentences work, how uh, the, there are transitions and how one sentence develops uh, the, the ideas of previous sentences and these kinds of things. Just very basic things we need to understand in order to properly uh, appreciate what God's word has to say to us. Uh, one final note about the illumination of the Holy Spirit, and that is that the, the Spirit does not bring to us new revelation. He merely uh, illumines our, our minds and our understanding so that we can appreciate what God's revelation already is. He's given to us his word. And that's what we reflect upon. That's what the Spirit illumines uh, our minds for. And as we s 
study the Word of God, we begin to see not only what it says, but also how it applies to our lives. And we begin to hide that Word in our hearts to protect ourselves against sin and its many different influences. So the Spirit does not bring new revelation. Now this uh, goes against uh, several developments in, in uh, broader Christianity. You have the Pentecostal charismatic movement, which speaks of the the baptism of the Spirit with speaking in tongues and new revelations that come by this speaking in tongues, having an interpreter perhaps say what the Spirit is speaking to the church. And then you have some who prophesy within the church, thus says the Lord, you shall prosper, you shall do this or that. And the Spirit does not give new revelations. He directs our attention to the Scriptures. And we should go to the Scriptures to find our what the will of God is for us in life. The Spirit does not speak to the church anymore in tongues. That was appropriate to the church in its infancy. As the church was just a baby, if you will, then it was appropriate that we babbled and spoke in different tongues. The Spirit enabled us in that way, much as a a young child entering into the home babbles different things and he kind of thinks he knows he, what he's saying, but it's just babbling. Well, Christian Pentecostals are just kind of recapturing that infantile experience in babbling. There's no significance there. Quite often this experience of tongues that they have does not result in information. It's just an experience that they have. It's infantile. When you look at what Paul says about tongues in 1 Corinthians 14, you see that he values coherence. He values understanding. And so if somebody should speak in tongues, there should be an interpreter. If there's not an interpreter, then the the one who speaks in tongues should be silent. That's in the first century church. And so the emphasis was on uh, a coherent explanation of God's will for us. That's why Paul valued prophecy over tongues. Prophecy was the exposition of the word of God, the proclamation of the word of God in a coherent fashion so that people could understand what was being said. Tongues was incoherent. There's no rhyme or reason to it that the the people in the congregation could make sense of. Not even the speaker could understand what was being said. The gift of tongues and prophecies, uh, as well as miracles, were given to the church in its infancy until the scriptures were given to the church written down and uh, received as canonical by the church. And then those uh, earlier ways of God's revealing himself to his church scattered abroad, abroad without written scriptures, those earlier ways have been done away with, much as the old covenant uh, temple and rituals have fallen away with the coming of Christ So uh, tongues and prophecies and these kinds of things have fallen away for disuse because we have something much, much greater, the Word of God written for us so that we can know the will of God. And the Spirit illumines our minds to understand the Scriptures. And then we apply those Scriptures to life. That's where maturity comes in for the Christian believer. And so the Pentecostal movement, the charismatic movement, uh, says that the Spirit comes and brings new revelation to the church. Well, if that's really true, then you better start writing that down and including it in the canon of Scripture because it's the Word of God. Uh, it, it's, and I don't hear anybody recording that stuff and putting it in the book and canonizing it or saying it should be included as equal authority with Scripture. But if the Spirit speaks a word from God of that nature... You really need to be doing that. But beyond that, you have uh, the mainline Protestant church that similarly sees new revelation coming by the Spirit. Now, they don't follow the Pentecostal mindset, but their idea is that the church is continually growing and maturing and listening for God. I've spoken this from time to time about how if you enter a mainline protestant church you might have the pastor at the front man or woman saying listen for the word of god not listen to the word of god but listen for it as though there is some sort of existential experience that this 
that, that, that you have in which the Spirit speaks to you in that moment. And it may not be from the scriptures themselves, it may be beyond that, it likely will be beyond that, and that is God's revelation to you today. And so in this modern age, uh, where we see progressive revelation within the church in the mainline Protestant point of view, we move on from what Paul had to say about women serving as elders and pastors in the church or denying their place in that regard. We say that's something for that older period of time, but we have matured and the Spirit has shown us more. And so we move on to new things. And in the past, there were prescriptions against homosexuality in the church, but we have matured and the Spirit now is telling us that we ought to be receiving everyone in love and accepting their behaviors. And so what the mainline Protestant church has done is separate us from the message of scriptures given for us once for all in the pages of scripture and replace that with a revelation of the spirit that sifts and changes over time to suit circumstances and, and develops like that. This also is a new revelation, if you will, from God. And uh, that's also to be opposed. The Spirit merely illumines what the original text of Scripture says, enables us to see, and how, see how it applies to our world today. That is what we should be looking for today, and not new revelations. Um, the same goes with the Roman Catholic Church and their view of the, the Pope and various uh, church councils and things what the church has decided upon, the assumption of Mary into heaven and these kinds of things uh, as revelations from God about this is true. Um, God does not bring us new revelation. He's given it to us in his word. And now the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, the first generation that God has given as a revelatory organ for the church to give the deposit of scripture. And now we build on that scripture as we seek to understand what it has to say. And that scripture sets the parameters for how we understand God's will for our lives. And so we are illumined by the spirit to understand the scriptures. That scripture is not a dead document in the past, but it's living and active. It applies to us today. And the spirit takes it to illumine our minds so that uh, our, our, our life is uh, lived in light, in truth, in love, and glory. Well, this is Pastor McLaren for First Presbyterian Church. I want to invite you to come to our services each Sunday at 9.30 in the morning. Then we have a Sunday school class uh, following that. Hope that you will join us for that time. We have great times of fellowship and wonderful times of worship as well. We look forward to seeing you, and may God richly bless you from his word. Take care. God bless. Bye.